title of the session is Organizing Resistance of the United States, and it's being chaired by Marina Adams, who is a master's student in the Department of Portuguese and Brazilian Studies at Brown University. She works on feminism, gender, and Brazilian military dictatorship, among other topics. And she is the national organizer and newsletter, newsletter editor of the U.S. Network for Democracy in Brazil. I'm going to talk in Portuguese one thing. É, eu não sou do Candomblé, mas me disseram que meu orixá é Oxaguiã. Aliás, que meu pai de santo me falou isso. É, e ori, o, o Xaguiã... So I, I don't follow the Candomblé religion, but, uh, but I was assigned a deity by Erisvaldo. And I think Marina is my deity, because she, she's kind of my guardian angel. She came here and she said, I want to I wanna organize something. How do I, how do I you know, do activism? She's been an activist for many years, and so um, you know, she's, she can keep pace with me, so we're a wonderful partnership. So I'm very grateful. I'm going to start in English, but then uh, I'll switch into... I'll start in Portuguese, rather, and I'll switch to English. Uh, thank you very much, Jim, for your, this uh, sensational introduction. I'm, I, I'm, I, I'm, it's been a privilege to be here at Brown and... Uh, uh, it's very great to find people here in the U.S. that think like we do, that are so excited to organize and to, and are so worried about the situation in Brazil. I'd like to thank Ramon, of course, uh, because if it were just up to Jim and, and I, this, this conference would not have happened. And I'd like to thank all of you who were invited and who have participated um, our invitations were a little bit last minute at times, <clears throat> but uh, we're very grateful that you worked with us for, to be able to be here and to, to speak with us. So, <laughs> so you were gonna we're gonna start with uh, Jim, who who presented who introduced me. James Green is a professor. Oh, ele é professor de uh, história e cultura na Brown University. Initiative, the executive director of the Brazilian Studies Association and the national coordinator of the U.S. Network for Democracy in Brazil. Eu acho que essa essa breve descrição não faz jus a ele, mas eu vou deixar ele falar um pouco agora sobre tudo que ele tem feito. Organizing a campaign to defend Manuela Conceição, who was a peasant worker leader who was in prison and and uh, I wasn't able to get people to sign the petition. They didn't know anything about Brazil. They didn't believe that, that what, what was going on. And it was a, it was a very large, uh, big culture shock uh, to, to, to learn that nobody knew about Brazil. And so uh, it's, it's difficult to, to campaign in that sense. And so I wrote a book about this first moment uh, of solidarity with Brazil, which is uh, In Spite of You, uh, talking about the resistance to the military dictatorship in the in the U.S. and uh, we cannot remain silent was the title in in English. We cannot remain silent was the first. Um, it was kind of a first manifesto signed by intellectual intellectual academics and others uh, against torture during the dictatorship. And so I'm going to speak about ten minutes and. Uh, talk a little bit about the origins of this moment, this movement, the U.S. Network for Democracy in Brazil, but I would like to give a historical context, uh, because I'm a historian, to explain that we are not starting from zero, from nothing. It's a movement that's been going on for 50 years here in the U.S. And so uh, there are five gr big moments, big stages in this relationship. First, the the, the first campaign was in the 70s against torture in Brazil with Marcio Moreira Alves and a group of academics and clergy and people who had links with Brazil. Um, so a couple of them were exiles, um, exiled from Brazil and people, so people were, had, had felt this solidarity with Brazil even though they didn't necessarily speak Portuguese or hadn't been to Brazil before. So this stage was really important to, to uh, for us to understand how do we construct activities in favor of uh, Latin American human rights in the U.S., not just for Brazil, but for Chile, Argentina, Uruguay, and other, and other countries. And so what was important was that this little movement um, learned how to make alliances with uh, the Catholic Church and Protestant churches, and they were able to 
uh, put on activities with uh, and uh, with the press. They convinced the New York, New York Times and Washington Press to to post opinion op-eds about uh, the Brazilian dictatorship in 70, 71, and they 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 learned how to um, work with the civil rights activists. And, you know, worked with Abernathy, who was a, a kind of an inheritor of Martin Luther King's legacy, and so. This, this first moment of um, solidarity it happens at this time in, in 70, 71. And this is, this is the moment when I started learning about how to demonstrate solidarity with Brazil. Now, in the 1980s, when there were these strikes um, in, in Sao Paulo, and, and Lula was put in prison in 1980, and, and then there was a second stage in which uh, Larry McKirk and Larry Wright, they, they founded... Brazil Labor and Information Center in an attempt to create solidarity between uh, Brazilian labor unions and American labor unions, which uh, um, before had been pro-American, had been uh, in defense of the military dictatorship and, and the capitalist system. But, but The movement against the war in Vietnam and other other things uh, kind of began a new moment in the in this relationship, and so these union these unions came together and created a strong links of solidarity. Lula came to the U.S. various times to to kind of concrete that solidarity, and so the third moment in this movement uh, is is came about in 1992, talking about uh, environmental problems, uh, issues with indigenous populations, and trying to uh, to create links with uh, NGOs to defend the rights of indigenous people, environmental rights. And so it was another moment in which, um, you know, there was preoccupation, concern with Brazil, but it was, it was still very limited in its uh, reach. And so the Next stage is that of the election of Lula in 2002, and Stanley Gasek, who's on the program, but he wasn't able to be here to present today. He, he and I, we organized the Brazil Strategy Network, and which was uh, a, a, a mistaken reading of what was happening in Brazil. Um, we thought we knew what was going on, and for, for you know, there were various reasons. You know, the war in Iraq, um, the the letter that Lula wrote to the Brazilian people, we were unable to to carry out effective work. But we did um, reach out and, and create relationships with Brazilian immigrants because uh, in that period of time there were a lot of Brazilians coming here and so we were, and this is when I, where I, when I met Miriam and there was a lot of, um, there were a lot of links established between academics, the friends of the MST, which is the landless peasant workers movement and we were able to uh, talk to the, the those in support of the labor party uh, and it, during each election we ca organized campaigns to convince a couple of Brazilians in New Jersey, New York, Boston to vote for the left in these elections and so there was also a moment in which the Brazilian Studies Association began to have more visibility and more structure Luis, uh, you know, was Luis Valencia, who's a professor here, was part of that process of strengthening this Brazilian Studies Association, and it was kind of the peak of Brazilian studies here. You know, the Brazilian government created a situation in which everyone was optimistic. Everybody wanted to study about Brazil. Business people wanted to learn about Brazil, and you know, kind of get in the, on the business scene there. And so there was a the possibility of reaching a lot of people and there were a lot of Brazilianists that were that that, that were uh, you know taught in this period and now the fifth moment is is um, after 2016 and it was not that people weren't protesting before but this is uh, a moment of extreme of, of increased movement and protests and mobilization to uh, to go against Dilma's impeachment and to oppose Bolsonaro's election. Now there's 25 groups part of this network, and they're working in you know uh, based on universities and other groups. And 
among these groups, and there are a lot of groups, and I don't want to offend anyone, but I have to highlight here that the, one of the most fundamental groups for uh, our solida solidarity is Defend Democracy in Brazil, and we have many of their activists here today. And they deserve our applause because it was a activism of people who were already integrated in American society. They were working, they had families, they, they had their, you know, were working through their immigration status. They didn't really have uh, so many resources, they didn't have NGOs, but they were constantly fighting, especially in New York and Washington. Uh, Juliana was part of that. And people in Boston and San Francisco and other places, they were very important to the growth of this movement. And, and of course, there were the elections last year. Now, with this trajectory and this this context in mind of the history of Brazilian of U.S. and Brazilian solidarity, uh, on December first, twenty eighteen, we were at Columbia Law School in New York, and we were there were two hundred people that came together to organize this national movement, and there were about you know as I said two hundred people between academics, immigrants, um, you know, Brazilian students here in the U.S., and because there are a lot of them because of the various programs that the, uh, the exchange programs that exist, we formed 14 working groups, and we created a committee, a coordinating committee that has uh, 40 affiliate groups, and we have, <laughs> we do something crazy, which is that we have virtual meetings with 40 people that you can't even, you know, you can't hear or see people well, you, can't, you can hear people, you can't see them. Uh, anyway, these meetings are um, a monthly thing, and we, we decided to do this first national campaign um, on the anniversary of the assassination of Marielle Franco, the city councilwoman in Rio. And so we talked about doing about 50 national activities or so in, in various uh, places. So we organized vigils, public demonstrations, academic activities uh, in honor of her. And it was a very important thing in terms of the academic uh, and national movement. And after that, um, you know, it's interesting. That I think we're, we're going through the phases of trying to establish a n national democracy uh, network. And I think this is, uh, you know, in the, during the Q and A, I hope, uh, Mar uh, Marina and others will 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 contribute, but this this the the next moment was it was talking about impeding the presence of Jair Bolsonaro in the in the Met um, Museum. You know, they the the New York mayor has we don't r really know exactly what happened, but because of our protests, um, he will not be honored at at the Met. And there may be, they might do it another place, but uh, but it's it's something that that we've we worked really hard for. And so, the other people at this table are going to talk about their activities, but I wanted to talk about a couple of things quickly here. So, um, we were able to identify people who 234 uh, in 234 colleges and universities, uh, people signed um, our our kind of manifesto and our statement. So we started to count people that had, those who had signed, and we have more than uh, 1,500 people who are subscribed to our newsletter that comes out twice a month. And our primary goal is to reach the American public. So even though our, uh, kind of the backbone of this movement is Brazilians who are here, uh, our objective is to reach the American public progressive, liberal Americans who know kind of about Bolsonaro, they know he's bad, but they don't really know so much about him. And we understand that this is a, this is a, a fight that's been, that's gonna go on for a long time. Um, and in the mobilizations and the protests of 2013, I saw a sign that explained everything. And they said it was, it's not 20 cents, which was the increase in the bus fare. They said it's not 20 cents, not about the 20 cents, it's about 500 years of exploitation and oppression and we know that it's not enough to just elect Haddad or other people from the left. These questions that are raised and that have been talked about in this conference and, and thought through really well, uh, you know, who we would invite to this conference and our movement for the U.S. Uh, Network for Democracy in Brazil is, has, has this goal. I'm going to stop there. I'm going to uh, say a few words at the end. 
but now let's have Marina speak a little bit about the obser uh, the observatory for Democracy in Brazil and that that we are that is another one of our projects. Okay, so when this idea came up of the network, uh, when Jim brought this to us, this idea to us that at Brown we would create, you know, this network between academics and activists in Brazil, another idea came up of, you know, how are we going to transform this into something that's practical? How are we going to product content, or excuse me, produce content and visibility? And so the suggestion came that we create an observatory. Why an observatory? Because an observatory is a kind of institution that dialogues. Uh, you know, it's uh, it's an academic. It belongs to the academic sphere, but it also dialogues with the Brazilian structures. So through the observatory, we would be able to work with observatories in Brazil. So the idea of the observatory is something that we're calling the U.S. Observatory for Democracy in Brazil. And it's the, d the idea is that from our working groups, these 14 working groups that we formed in December, that we're going to produce content in English for the American public. Um, and, you know, kind of capitalizing on the, the tradition of observatories in Brazil and um, trying to solidify our relationship with the American public in which uh, hopefully people will go to us to try and understand what's going on in Brazil. So we're going to we're going to be producing reports and, you know, basic things like getting news reports that are being produced in English uh, by the New York Times, The Guardian, for example, and other news outlets, mainstream media outlets, and compiling them into one place so that people can go to one spot and have this access point to to all of this content about Brazil that's in English, uh, content that is well thought, carefully thought out. And uh, our idea is that, you know, the democracy in Brazil will never reach a fullness if we're not taking care of all human rights and including um, all of the groups that make up Brazil in that process. And so ha keeping that in mind, these notions, and denouncing violations that happen in Brazil. And just to, to kind of complement that, we had, we had planned to launch our website today, but we're working with two students there, and they are great, they're creative, but they're also, they also have final exams and they get sick. So the person who was gonna come and, and who was going to finalize the project told us that you know they had a test and anyway so we're going to have a soft launch now and then we're going to kind of fine tune things and then have a, a an official launch later so we're going to make it live we're going to kind of test the waters and and make sure it works and uh, and then we'll kind of fine tune things and and have a a scheduled launch when it's totally ready <laughs> she can't wait to start talking. So I'm going to I'm going to go right to uh, what's written about her. So Gladys Mitchell é professora associada University of Wisconsin Milwaukee who works on racism, Afro-Brazilian political behavior and opinion and affirmative action. She's the author of The Politics of Blackness, Racial Identity and Political Behavior in Contemporary Brazil among many publications. She's also the current president of the Brazilian Study Association and uh, I would say a crucial member of our network uh, without whom also, many things wouldn't happen. So please welcome Gladys. Primeiro, gostaria de agradecer o Jim, a Marina, Ramon, todo mundo. Friends, I've really, really enjoyed it. 
Um, e também eu vou falar em inglês, mas eu tenho muitas fotos, então fica tranquila. <laughs> It's going to be fine. Um, okay, so the first thing I want to do is um, to dedicate this presentation to um, Mestre Moa do Catende, Marielle Franco, Carlos Marigueira, e um, Ivaldo dos Santos Rosa. I think it's important to um, acknowledge the people who have um, worked, you know, in this struggle. Um, so today what I'm going to talk about is my involvement in the U.S. network for democracy in Brazil. Um, and as Jim mentioned, there are at least 14 committees. And I'm, um, I work with the Afro-Brazilian Committee. Um, so I'm, I'm just going to talk about some of our activities. Um, I have this slide. Um, I'm sure you all have already seen these. Um, but this is just to give you an idea of where Brazil is right now, um, and also how the president um, responds to what's going on in Brazil. Um, so again, uh, you can see here, this is the president saying that um, the children of Bosa Familia beneficiaries have um, a low intellectual development. Um, and then as Douglas already, I think it was Douglas, or someone else already mentioned in terms of um, Ivaldo's death, um, this was the black family whose car was um, shot at by the military um, over 80 or 80 times. Um, and his response was that the Brazilian um, military doesn't kill anyone. So we can think about what that means in terms of um, the population who was mainly killed. Um, and in this case, it was a black family and who he's referring to when he says um, no one, right? Um, Okay, so I just have this um, book cover. It's from Jamie Alvis's book, The Anti-Black City, Police Terror and Black, um, and Urban Life in Brazil. Um, it's an excellent book. He's looking at Sao Paulo, but it's really, it's relevant to the entire country of Brazil. Um, so what we are doing in our committee is to raise awareness of the social, economic, and, com and political conditions of Afro-Brazilians historically and under the current president. We also want to strengthen ties with Af Afro-Brazilian activists and advocate for Afro-Brazilian rights. Um, so you'll see in my PowerPoint, but also along with my work, um, what I do is I'm not going to recommend um, <laughs> what I should do or what we should do. Um, as Americans, but I really do want to listen to what Afro-Brazilian activists are saying um, that they are already doing and how we can support their efforts. Um, so that's why I have here, this is a book by an Afro-Brazilian activist, but even um, in some of the work, you'll see how I reference um, what people are already doing. Um, so I think I have this on another slide, but. But some of the issues that, that we are looking at are um, issues of land titling, Bosa Familia, police violence, education, um, and the rights of African-based religious practitioners. Um, so all of these things are under threat under the current um, administration. One of the things, this is kind of dark, the picture, um, but what I did in March, March 11th, 11th, 2019, was to give a congressional briefing in Washington, D.C. Um, and these are, and so the briefing that I gave were, um, was about these issues that I just mentioned. Um, and so I cite activists such as Sandra Andrade, who does work on Quilombola rights. I also cited um, Douglas, who I don't think he's here right now. Um, but I cited a document where he was talking about police brutality in Brazil. Um, so again, this is with an effort to actually listen to what activists are saying are um, important issues and then integrating that into um, the advocacy work. Sherelle Barber 
is also on our committee, and she has a film called I, a Black Woman Resist, which is about Marielle Franco. So she was actually there in Rio um, when Marielle had um, her last meeting where she was, um, it was a meeting of black women. And so what she did is to, to then make a film. And this film is for um, an American audience, right? So there are lots of people uh, including African Americans who don't know what's going on in Brazil. And we want to make sure that we first um, reach out and educate people um, first, and then we can get them to also advocate um, in a meaningful way. Um, so at the briefing, Alex was there. Um, Juliana also helped out, so thank you for that. Um, and, and again, um, Sherelle Barber was there showing her film and also talking about the situation of black women as well as Marielle Franco's legacy um, and what she stood for. Um, so March 14, 2019, this is one of the events that, that Jim cited when he was talking about, you know, over 50 events happened throughout the country. So at the National Conference of Black Political Scientists, um, we had a panel and uh, what we did is we also honored Marielle Fran Franco there. Um, so Silvio Humberto, who's holding the t-shirt, is a city council member in Salvador Bahia. Um, so he spoke, um, and it was, it was great to have him there to speak. Um, and we had a number of Brazilians, so there are at least five or six Brazilians in this picture. And I'll, I will let you all figure out who they are. Um, <laughs> but it was great because this is a conference of um, African descendant political scientists, mainly African American. So it was an opportunity, again, for us to educate people. Um, and, and people have lots of connections. So it's good to let um, other academics and activists know what's going on in Brazil. Um, also, I should mention the reason that we have a number of um, Afro-Brazilians um, in the picture who were at the conference is that I'm also part of a team um, of black political scientists who won a grant along with um, black Brazilian scholars to do collaborative research. So I'm also using that group to advocate um, for these, for the rights that, I'm, that I mentioned. This is just a flyer showing the places where Chevrel Barber is showing her film. So this was, um, it goes to March 2019, but she's also going to show it May, I believe it, um, at Harvard, and she has some other um, places where she's going to show it. So she's going around the country showing this film um, to universities, to high schools, to middle schools, um, with, again, the, the goal of educating African Americans. <clears throat> I should also mention that she's the daughter of William Barber, um, a well-known civil rights activist in the United States. Kia Caldwell is, is also on the committee, and so she has also been involved in um, sitting on panels to talk about the film as well as um, to raise the issue um, of, of Afro-Brazilians. This is a conference that's going to be held April 23rd. Um, and Michael Hanter is the chair of Africana Studies at the University of Pennsylvania, I'm also a member of the committee. And um, he's organized this conference to talk about the rise of um, the right globally so that we can see this is not just a Brazilian problem, um, but that it's in the United States, it's um, you know, throughout Europe. So this is a conference that's, that's coming up. Um, and then Sherelle recently went to, um, to Rio. This was maybe a week or two ago. Um, and she met with Jerema uh, Wernick, who's the co-founder of Criola, um, and also um, a member of Amnesty International. Or not a member, but she's um, <laughs> directing it. <laughs> Um, so I, I wanted to mention that because she did have a meeting with her and she took a lot of notes in terms of what Jerema was saying that they need and, and what we should be advocating for. 
So these are just some pictures, again, from Chevrolet traveling in the United States, educating um, people about Marielli's um, case. Again, these are some schools, organizations um, that where she's shown her film. Um, another thing that I wanted to talk about in terms of how we are trying to support Afro-Brazilian activists and scholars is that Elizabeth, who many of you all saw with the adorable baby, um, so we organized this um, GoFundMe campaign for Michelle Chagas, who is, um, an activist in Salvador Bahia. Um, he works at the Stevie Beagle Cultural Institute. So this is an organization that prepares um, low-income and Afro-Brazilian students uh, for the college entrance exam. And he was at Duke, um, I think it was in 2008, uh, getting his master's in public policy. He wasn't able to he finished all of his courses. The only thing left that he has to do is to turn in his thesis. Um, but, you know, since a lot of time has passed, they require a registration fee um, so that he can get his degree and turn in the thesis. So we've been raising money um, for him. So that's, um, again, a collaborative effort um, to support black activists and the, and the very important work that they are doing. Um, and then lastly, I just, again, wanted to acknowledge the black activism that, that has always um, been happening in Brazil. Um, so, of course, we can think about since slavery, right, people um, running away to form quilombos. And I think Douglas talked about this earlier, right? We can't just act like there hasn't been black activism. Of course, there has been. Um, so I just had these pictures. And then, so the other thing that the committee um, at our last meeting that we spoke about was how to keep up the momentum. Um, one thing that we've talked about um, is that we can write op-eds. We've also talked about contacting local and state politicians. So even in our committee, we are spread in a number of states throughout the United States. So contacting uh, state representatives um, and local representatives and educating them about what's going on in Brazil. We also discussed the idea of teachings for students, faculty, and community members. Um, and then another important thing, which is what I, um, when I actually just asked black activists what they would like us to do, many people kept mentioning translating um, their publications. And this, you know, so some of these are actually academic articles, but a lot um, of them are just blog posts. Anything that they have written um, is really important to, to translate those. And I think once we have the observatory going, um, that, that would be something that we would do. We would be able to translate and then just kind of deposit it there and, and so people would know where to go. Um, another thing that we've talked about is creating a database of black Brazilian activists and scholars for research training, potential collaborative grants, and research <coughs> talks. Um, so me and Elizabeth had already talked about this before, but I, I think it's really important um, to have this database so that um, when people, for example, my university does not have the same type of resources that Brown has, but um, if there was someone coming here speaking at Brown, perhaps my university could afford to have them to, to fly to Wisconsin. Afterwards, they could fly to Florida or, or wherever else. Um, so we're thinking about creating a database of black American scholars and activists along with black Brazilian scholars and activists so that we can continue this um, transnational activism. Thank you. Muito obrigada, Gladys, por essa apresentação. É, por último, então, a gente vai chamar o Alex Main. Uh, esse... um, and his work has to do, he has the intention of um, kind of creating visibility in Washington, and so we want to have a congressional campaign, and we, we're trying to create this campaign 
um, and develop. And so we, nobody's been more fundamental in this process than Alex and Juliana. And então, Alex Mendes é o diretor. Um, in DC. In his work at the CEPR, Alex monitors, monitors economic and political developments in Latin America and the Caribbean and regularly engages with policymakers and civil society groups from around the region. So without further ado, please, Alex. Uh. Bring this together uh, on top of all the other activities you're involved in. I mean, this is really impressive. Um, so I'm at the Center for Economic and Policy Research. It's a small think tank in Washington, D.C. Um, we are uh, also working with the U.S. Network for Democracy in Brazil. And so we work on economic issues and foreign policy issues, um, and often they, they overlap quite a bit. And in terms of Brazil, we've been working on Brazil for years, but mostly on the economic policy front. And, um, you know, both highlighting some of the social and economic achievements um, under the PT administrations and also um, offering some criticism of some of the policies, uh, particularly towards the end, the interest rate policy and so on. And we have a lot of papers that you can find on our website, uh, www.cepr.net. Um, but uh, we began to be very concerned with what was going on in Brazil um, around the beginning of 2016, in fact, a bit before that, but um, we began to be a bit more involved on the foreign policy front um, regarding Brazil in early 2016 when we uh, saw the whole campaign around the impeachment uh, for Dilma. And of course, things went from bad to worse, and we've remained very engaged. Um, and in terms of our engagement, we do a lot of things. We publish articles, um, we do a lot of media work, uh, but we also do quite a bit of congressional work. And we're a small operation, so I'm a policy analyst and I do some writing, um, and I'm constantly monitoring events in Brazil and other countries. Uh, but I also do the brunt of the congressional work um, for CEPR. But um, it would be impossible if it weren't for the help of others. Um, on our own, we wouldn't be doing anything, I don't think. It's just uh, too much work uh, for a small outfit like ours. Um, so we really count on the help of coalitions. And on Brazil, there hadn't really been a very big coalition. There'd been a few groups that we'd worked with, um, and in, you know, primarily with um, Brazilians for democracy and social justice in terms of all the congressional work we were doing, and also we work with the defense, uh, Defend Democracy in Brazil uh, and others, but there wasn't a big coalition, and so I see a lot of big opportunities now for our congressional work because the coalitions are very important. And so we're now going to talk about Congress, um, and hopefully between me and Juliana we can convince those that are not convinced that it's worth um, doing congressional work around Brazil. So I'm, I'm going to try to provide kind of an overview of uh, the congressional work, um, uh, the sort of role that Congress is, is meant to play and, and how, you know, we can fit into that. Um, and I think Juliana is going to talk a little bit more about the nuts and bolts around the work that has been done so far uh, on Brazil in Congress. I'm going to provide more of an overview. Um, and so I think, as you know, uh, you know, Congress, um, you know, constitutionally doesn't have a big role in terms of foreign policy. Um, and the worst thing is that it's uh, actually been giving away the few powers it, it has um, over the years. It's been, you know, giving more power to the presidency to carry on war without calling it war, um, to implement economic sanctions, um, to uh, essentially sign treaties that they, they don't call treaties and so on. Um, but the role of, of Congress uh, and foreign policy is to try to rein in the worst excesses or, or to, you know, keep uh, the executive branch in check uh, to some extent. And, you know, this has been really critical in the past. Uh, I'm, I'm going to refer to a few Latin America examples that I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with, but I think it's good to remember them, um, that during the dirty wars in Central America in the 1980s, um, Congress 
played a really vital role. Um, obviously, they didn't stop these wars, but um, you know, they helped kind of lift the veil of secrecy around e U.S. involvement in, in the wars in Central America and Guatemala, El Salvador, Nicaragua. Um, and then, you know, they, they really did uh, do their best at a certain point towards the mid-80s to um, prevent the Reagan administration um, from uh, carrying out uh, the worst of these military sort of actions in, in Central America, and primarily by blocking military aid um, to Guatemala, um, blocking aid to the Contras. Of course, we know what happened to that. The Iran-Contra uh, affair occurred, you know, where we learned that, um, uh, in fact, uh, resources were being diverted from sales to Iran of, of weaponry through Israel. I won't go into the details, but I'm sure everyone's aware of how the Reagan administration got around things and illegally funded um, the Contras in, in Nicaragua. But at any rate, uh, Congress forced them to go undercover in doing that. And then there's some other things I think that are worth mentioning. Just one example um, of how uh, Congress has been able to sort of exercise a little bit more control, accountability around U.S. operations in Latin America. You have um, uh, the Leahy Amendment, I think, stands out, which is, it's Patrick Leahy from Vermont in the, in the late 90s. Um, he managed to get an amendment to uh, foreign assistance legislation that was passed uh, that um, required uh, the State Department to perform a vetting, a human rights vetting, of um, all of the units that were receiving uh, U.S. support. And, and this resulted in a lot of units, and at the time in Colombia in particular, uh, no longer getting support, units that were involved in human rights abuses. Um, so these are some of the things that Congress has done in the past. Um, Congress has various forms of leverage in terms of foreign policy to, um, you know, advance, uh, you know, the agendas of particular groups within Congress. Uh, you have um, the Senate confirmation process um, for all of the uh, all of the individuals that are appointed to um, the, you know, to high positions in the State Department. Uh, they also exercise, obviously, control over the appropriations process, over the budget. Um, and so this has been used at times to advance right-wing agendas um, in Latin America. And so, for instance, I'm, I'm going to focus mostly on the example of Honduras going forward because that's another country I've worked on a lot. And um, so we saw, for instance, in late 2009, you had Senator DeMint, a Republican, um, who held up uh, some key uh, Latin American Department of State confirmations in order to get the uh, U.S. administration to recognize the elections in Honduras that were being held under the coup government. Uh, so you had every country in the region that had, you know, stated formally that they were not going to recognize these elections, that um, the democratically elected president, uh, Manuel Zelaya, needed to be returned to power, uh, you know, before, um, you know, they would recognize elections. Uh, the Republicans put pressure um, through this holding up of the confirmations um, of two individuals, Sh Shannon and Valenzuela. Shannon was uh, appointed uh, the ambassador to Brazil, um, and, it, and it worked. Um, I think there were other factors at play, but uh, certainly that played a big role. The U.S., uh, Shannon himself announced that they were recognizing the elections, whether or not Manuel, was Manuel Zelaya was restored to power. Um, and immediately afterwards, his nomination and Valenzuela's were confirmed. Uh, but it's also been used to advance progressive agendas um, in, in other ways. The control over appropriations, for instance, you've had key appropriators, so members of the Appropriations Committee in both the Senate and the House that have held up funds, and in the case of, of Honduras, over human rights issues, to give one example, and funds have been held up a lot uh, for Honduras um, over horrible human rights abuses, but uh, one area, for instance, where there's been some success that can be pointed to is um, where Patrick Leahy, again, he's still around, he um, held up funds, security funding for the Honduran forces um, in order to ensure that there was advancement around the case of Berta Caceres's 
assassination. For those that don't know Berta Castro, she was a, an extraordinary indigenous uh, leader um, in, in um, Honduras who was brutally assassinated um, in an operation that involved uh, US trained Honduran security forces. So at any rate, this um, pressure from Patrick Leahy worked and the Berta Caceres case advanced. So um, I think another thing that's worth really emphasizing is the fact that Congress can help enormously in raising the visibility of an issue and shaping the foreign policy debate um, through hearings, through legislation, through statements, through letters. Um, you can help create a counter narrative to that that comes out of the State Department on any issue. The State Department puts out very strong messages, um, you, you know, their positions on various countries and their leaders and so on. Uh, and you can kind of change the optics by having Congress, you know, um, take, a, take a totally different position from that of the, of the administration. Uh, and this, in turn, uh, really helps shape the media narrative. Uh, for those that have read, you know, uh, you know Chomsky's analysis of, of the media on foreign policy issues, um, yeah, I'm sure you, you're aware of how the State Department has an enormous impact on, on the media narrative. And so it's useful for Congress to counter that. Um, and so again, we can refer historically to the hearings on Central America that occurred uh, during the 1980s, where some of the hor horrible abuses that weren't getting a lot of coverage, weren't getting a lot of notice by uh, you know, military governments backed by the US uh, were talked about um, in, in these hearings, as well as the U.S. sort of complicity in all of that. Um, so more recently, again, the example of Honduras, um, we've had a number of things that we've done in, in Congress, including a piece of legislation called the Berta Caceres Act, which has now been around uh, for six years. So it's been introduced in three different Congresses. Um, this is the third Congress now where it's been introduced. And uh, it focuses on her killing, but it also, it's a piece of legislation that gives a whole description of the many uh, abuses um, uh, that are carried out in Honduras in which the security forces are involved. Um, so it's kind of an, a piece of, it, it helps educate Congress on, on, on these issues. And, and it also has had a big impact in the media. It's gotten a lot of coverage in the media in both the U.S. and um, the Honduran media. And it's helped highlight the authoritarian nature of the Honduran government, um, all these killings of activists like Berta Caceres that have occurred with impunity, um, and I think has really sort of helped reshape the image of Honduras, um, that if you just listen to the State Department, would be an almost squeaky clean one, including under the Obama administration. And in fact, most of this work was done under the Obama administration. Um, so uh, there have also been a number of statements and letters on Honduras. Um, Congress just became a very big platform for airing concerns over situation in Congress. A group within Congress that's very important that I'm sure Juliana is going to talk about is the Congressional Progressive Caucus. Um, and they have been big champions of human rights and democracy in, in Honduras. And we're hoping that they can become even bigger champions on, uh, you know, Brazil issues as well. Um, so, Juliana will talk about um, the, what, seven letters, I think, that we've done over the years. I just want to finish by describing a little bit the context that we're going into. That's not an easy one. Um, and this has been the case for a long time, where I would say most of the members of Congress that are really involved um, in Latin America, that care about Latin America, that have an agenda, uh, really, that they prioritize, are ultra-conservative. They're either Cold War hawks, um, uh, you know, people like Jesse Helms, Dan Burton, Henry Hyde, and they're now there's a new generation <laughs> of these hawks as well. Pompeo was one of them, obviously. Um, and then you have, of course, the Cuban-American and South Florida legislators who are up, continue to be obsessed with Cuba, even though, you know, uh, polls show that, you know, the majority of Cuban-Americans uh, don't share the same obsession, or at least don't share their obsession with toppling, uh, you know, the government in Cuba at all costs. 
um, and they're by extension obsessed with all of the other left-leaning uh, movements, governments in uh, Latin America that are friendly to Cuba. Uh, the, today the focus has been really on uh, Venezuela, uh, obviously over the last few months in particular. Um, these legislators see Venezuela as controlled by the Cubans and also responsible for propping up Cuba. Um, uh, they have a really skewed view of, of Latin America. Um, we have to contend with them, and they're the, they're the primary actors on Latin America in Congress. So that's quite challenging. And they often occupy very key positions um, uh, in the foreign affairs, the foreign relations committees, um, the appropriations committee, um, and of course, you have people like uh, Senator Marco Rubio that play a very outsized role because uh, um, in the current context, uh, Rubio has enormous influence over Latin America policy in the Trump administration and has managed to push through uh, a lot of particularly harmful policies towards Latin America, including, I think, he's uh, among those that pushes for a very strong alliance between Trump and Bolsonaro. Um, ah, un minuto, okay. Uh, but, okay, I just, I'll, I'll end on a more positive note, which is that we now have a lot of opportunities, and I'm, I'm you know, really excited uh, with the new configuration that we have in the House of Rep Representatives, where it's, it's not only a Democratic majority for the first time since 2010, uh, but we have more progressive Democrats uh, that are often quite progressive on foreign policy uh, than we have ever had um, in, in, in Congress that I'm aware of. Uh, so, you know, that's something that we get to work with um, and where we have a lot more opportunities. Um, I would say that we also um, have the fact that there are a lot of Democrats that are now pushing for reigning in presidential power in a way that uh, we didn't have before. We've been seeing this particularly around Yemen and war powers. Um, I can go into the details later on that. Uh, but um, Bolsonaro has also given us some opportunities um, in that uh, there are now a lot more groups that are interested in, in, in helping with Brazil uh, certainly in Washington, uh, but also around the country. Um, and also many members of Congress are now, you know, very concerned and want to do things around Brazil. So um, I think we have a huge opportunity to do a lot together. Um, and, you know, there are, uh, I think we can take things to another level. And we're going to talk about that a little bit as well with Juliana. Bom, vou falar em português. É, eu não falo muito sobre essas coisas em português, então peço desculpa de antemão se rolar um pouco de... Stumble a little bit. And I'm very honored to be here and uh, sharing this, this uh, table with these great figures and this conference with uh, the heavy hitters. And I'm sorry I got uh, a little over excited at the coffee break. I was... Uh, I was really enjoying it. So just to uh, kind of piggyback on what Alex was talking about, I'm going to talk about the importance and the impact of work in Congress. And I didn't have a lot of time to write, uh, you know, bullet points and kind of outline my, my thoughts very well. But I'm going to read a little bit so that I don't miss and don't skip over anything. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the impact that we've had up until now. Um, and the impact that we hope to have moving forward in, with our work in Congress. So uh, t up till now, we've had about, so we've, we've written six letters. Uh, the seventh is, un, you know, we're making it right now, we're writing it, and it's circulating in Congress. And a couple of briefings, uh, like the one Gladys participated in, uh, and Jim's participated in one with Stanley Gasek, who we hoped would be here, but he wasn't able to be here. And other briefings to talk with people about what's happening in Brazil. And declarations, tweets, uh, coordination with media in Brazil and the United States as well. So in these six letters, the first was in July of 2016, 
And this letter, in this letter, we got uh, 54 signatures, and it broke a record or set a record uh, that had been in place for 30 years. That uh, you know the U.S. hadn't hadn't uh, supported progressive uh, issues in Brazil for a long time. So it, ga it garnered a lot of attraction, or a lot of attention rather, and signaled that the U.S. was a little bit, was able and ready to to follow a more progressive agenda. But the next day, Aluzio uh, Nunes was here, or he was in Washington rather, meeting with. Um, congressmen, senators who were conservative on the right, the State Department to, to uh, kind of talk about the strategies for the coup. And so from a progressive standpoint, nothing was really happened until that, hap that letter in 2016. And the seventh letter that's going around right now, we just got the word that it has 21 signatures so far. And you know, the more signatures it has, the, s the more strength it has. And, you know, these letters, I'm going to talk really quickly about w why we're celebrating having 21 signatures. Because uh, from the moment they begin to circulate, we need to do a work, a mobilizing work, an outreach to... Because, um, <coughs> you know, we want to... From, from the moment you want to take an idea to a Congress person who, who and, and try and have them move it forward, and I work with Alex on this uh, lobbying aspect of it, um, you know, from that moment in which they accept to, in, the, in this way they agree to read the letter and to uh, engage in this dear colleague process, we have to start calling, we have to ask them, okay, I, you know, we have to kind of do outreach and say, hey, have you seen this letter on dear colleague about Brazil and uh, on Dear Colleague, there are letters about the whole world and, you know, pr problems that are happening all around the world and also problems that happen in the United States. So we have to kind of work so that the, the Brazil questions, um, you know, that the Brazil questions come to the surface because we've got to do a lot of groundwork, send a lot of emails, visit people, go to briefings and, and things like that. So beyond that, there's also the work with the media you know, um, releasing things on time, getting them the documents they need so that they can be published on time. Uh, we can talk uh, about the details a little bit later <coughs> and how you guys can help, but, or maybe, maybe later today or maybe tomorrow when we're talking about more um, practical activist options. Uh, but these letters, just as Alex was explaining, they, they exist so that we can construct a narrative, so that we can construct political facts. And we have, for example, the first letter that was sent in July of 2016, the, uh, Juma's lawyer, Eduardo Cardoso, he, he cited the, the letter in his defense uh, before the Brazilian Senate. And you know, it's there in the minutes of the, and so you can, you can go look and, and find it. And he mentions this letter that was signed by uh, 54 congressmen in the, in the Congress people in the United States. And at the same time, in that period, uh, as a result of a lot of work, we, we got a declaration from a statement from Bernie Sanders, and there were others that came after this, but he was the first that, you know, uh, Gleesey Hubbard and other senators, they, they used uh, those statements to defend uh, Gilma in her hearings. And so the seventh letter that's that's going around right now that we're you know we're calling people and trying to raise its visibility and ask people to sign it, it's it's about a lot of the themes that we've been talking about today, uh, in the environment, indigenous issues, uh, people from Quilombal, as these maroon communities, and um, you know its target, its goal is attacking. Um, enterprises and companies that are attacking these groups. So the BlackRock, for example, um, and you know, committing human rights abuses and, and also exploiting the natural resources. And so we also see that uh, multilateral or, or uh, very extensive organizations, they, they create documents in which uh, they, they create kind of a, s a strategy for each Bra for each country. So the, the strategy for Brazil is being formed right now. Um, and so they're trying to put on this strategy that the coup, 
process was a legitimate transfer of power. And so we know that people are trying to find New York Times articles, Washington Post articles, um, you know, big, big news outlets, um, their articles. And for some people, they're, these, they're more credible than others, these news outlets. But um, so we're trying to to get get the word out that the impeachment that was actually not a legitimate political process, that it was a coup. So it's very important that we do this. So moving forward, um, we can and should increase this this impact by working together. And so um, as we continue to empower ourselves and do this footwork, which is, you know, uh, it requires a lot of hard work, you know, how we can how we can um, train people who want to be involved and how, and it's not that complicated. It's pretty simple to get involved <coughs> and map out all of the representatives uh, of the Progressive Caucus, caucus and, um, you know, others that we can, that can target and, and use them and their power and their influence in the network. As Jim mentioned, um, you know, the petition had 200 people from 200 universities on it. Uh, we have 45 states represented in the network. And so we have people that can do this work with their local congressmen in 45 of the states of the U.S. So this is a really great opportunity. We have to use that as a tool. We have to capitalize on that. So the denunciation that has to continue to happen, and it's urgent. And just as Douglas said, although he's already left, this these 80 shots, you know, that, that family that was shot 80 times their car is is not just a problem of today. And as Elonisi said, the, the problems, the environmental problems uh, with fishermen and women, this is not a problem that's just from today. And so this denunciation is even more urgent. The 30 years um, that have, the last 30 years um, in which we've, we've lost a lot of ground in terms of the progressive agenda. And we need to, we're a little bit behind, we need to construct international solidarity. So moving forward, uh, beyond this letter that's going around, we're hoping also, and Alex can give you a little bit more details about this, but we're hoping that we pass a resolution uh, which would deal with, which is different from a letter, it would, it would deal with the, the regression in Brazil um, in terms of political rights and human rights from 2016 forward, including the coup and the election and everything, uh, in a more broad and effective way. So this resolution would be, it would be non-binding legislation. Um, they don't sign it, but they sponsor it. And so this becomes part of their working agenda for these congressmen and women. And this uh, gives more visibility and gives us more influence when talking about Brazil. So this is one of the possibilities. Oh, I have a lot more to say. Sorry. But uh, in sum, we'll, we'll beyond this resolution, the letter that's going around, but also visiting people, and that's one, something that we also encourage uh, in terms of effectiveness and working with Congress. We had on, on Friday, Jean Willis, he visited uh, this, uh, Representative Cicilline uh, here in Rhode Island, and that, has a r that carries a lot of weight. Uh, meetings like that uh, have to continue. And they have to continue so that we can denounce what's happening in Brazil and make and put Brazil on the radar uh, of the senators and Congress people here in the U.S. And we also have to, you know, we have to know how to use this partnership with people here in the U.S., what actors can help our cause best, <coughs> and also, you know, which actors here uh, in the U.S. are against imperialism, and so you know, tr trying to map out who is it that is can be, can be can help us in our cause. So, some of these Congress people are also, um, you know, they get they get uh, blocked in in the, in the same way, and they get uh, kind of marginalized in the same way that happens in Brazil. So, so they also need our support. And in this sense, I'm going to mention really quickly the issue that we've already talked about today, which is the canceling of the event to celebrate Bolsonaro at the museum and, 
and others can go into more detail about this, but uh, between the people in New York and D.C., we wrote a petition, um, and within three or four hours, you know, we were talking to people on the subway, and um, we were trying to spread the word as, as quickly as we could. We, we wrote it in about uh, three or four hours. You know, we were all kind of doing other things, but, but we, we published this, um, this letter to, to raise visibility, and, you know, this was on a Friday, and over the weekend, 25,000 people signed this petition to not allow him uh, to be honored in the museum. And, and Monday morning early, we saw that tweet. And of course, that, that pressure was, was one of the contributing factors uh, to pressure the museum to cancel the event. And of course, this was, this was a victory for us. It was a, one of many victories that we have to have. It's maybe a little victory or a big victory, but... Um, you know, it, it might be, it, it goes al uh, along with those other letters that we've sent, but in any case, it are these, it's these little victories that uh, kind of recharge our energies a little bit, and, and that's been talked about today as well. So in terms of uh, rekindling our hope and our de de determination to resist. And Hadaji, when he was in Columbia he, University, he, he said, we have to resist, but we also have to act. We have to react and act. And so just to, to finish up, I wanted to, in this, within this big context, I wanted to express the necessity of solidarity in our co work with Congress. So if one of you wants to get involved a little bit more and wants to be part of our spreadsheet, you know, who called who and what time and what was the response, um, please come talk to us so that we can coordinate our efforts. So we can talk about that a little bit later. Um, and one thing that was mentioned earlier, I don't know if we already responded to it or not, but it was this idea that the observ observatory, what is it going to do and what can it do? Is it just going to observe uh, or is it going to actually act? And I think the working groups that, or excuse me, the working group that's, that's dealing with Congress, it does pretty much what the observatory is going to do. So in this sense, we're, we're looking for more solidarity uh, in our work with Congress, and we're looking for the possibility of having one person or more people who can work full-time uh, at this, uh, at, at, you know, somebody who can do that, who can make their, the quick, who can, who can send out quick responses to, to things. And we have this, this sense of urgency, but we don't have all the resources we need yet um, to, you know, to respond to the the news reports sometimes we have a lack of human resources to respond to everything so we are in the next few days we're going to have a couple of visits in washington we don't have time to coordinate with congress who who can take them you know who can meet with these people so we're we're always looking for somebody who's who can be full-time and 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 do this so Jim's going to talk a little bit more about this, but also, can I just have a couple more Brazilian, five more Brazilian minutes? So Elionisi, she, her comment was great that we, that we can use fear to motivate people to fight, and I think that's great. You know, uh, even outside Brazil, the way we talk about fear is something that comes from a place of privilege. Right, we're not in danger of being put in prison, of being stopped in the street, uh, which is something that can happen if you're in Brazil. But the fear is actually uh, a great tool. And when Bozo came here a couple weeks ago, we organized a protest um, that was based on fear, and we used this, you know we capitalized on the solidarity and collaboration of various radical groups in Washington. <clears throat> and it was really interesting because during the protest, many Brazilians didn't have the guts to go. They were afraid uh, because, you know, they, they were afraid of their visas being revoked or, or other things. But th those who went were unable to get uh, the megaphone and were able to say things. I, I went myself and I wasn't able to, to speak out. And I think that fear is, is justified in some way because... At the end of the day, we, we realize that one of the, the advisors to Bolsonaro, 
uh, was was there. He was taking a picture of us, um, and we saw you know the wire there, a couple meters away, and and you know there was a, there was an interview, and you can see this. This, there's a poster with a big pile of poop on it and, and behind him when he was giving the interview, and it was uh, related to the president. It was criticizing him. And so, you know, and I said, I wanted to, I, I wish I could have seen him and, and given and, and punched the, the fascist. But, um, you know, these are things that that are part of our, you know, ri reality here. And, and fear is, is a real thing. And, but it's, but fear can also be used to motivate people to act. And another thing that Elionisi, said earlier was that th this idea of the low tide and the high tide I loved this this analogy and I uh, I tell Jim a lot that we need to that we're uh, just kind of um, we're just getting the scraps of, of things and, and and I think in this in this time we you know we lost a battle but we have to kind of we can't we can't lose hope we have to uh, you know, put these shards together and create a mosaic so that when the time comes, we're ready to fight. I'd like to thank all of you one more time. So before we open to questions, Jim's going to say a few announcements, and then I'll, I'll make a couple announcements as well, and then we'll open it up to questions. Uh, my first announcement is really just to clarify something. Tomorrow morning... We, um, we've we reserved it for people who are activists, whether they're visiting Brazilians, whether they're Brazilians living here, whether you're Americans who are interested in helping, uh, but to discuss tactics and strategies. So I hope, I hope people who are still able to be here will come tomorrow uh, so that we can talk about tactics and strategies for activism in Brazil and, and elaborate on what we've talked about and possibilities and new ideas, how we can work together. So that's the first thing. The second thing that I think is important uh, is that we, we're going to propose the National Steering Committee is that we create a campaign mm -hmm. so that we can organize in a systematic way uh, our outreach to Congress throughout the world and to to support this resolution that's being proposed. That's really important. And there, there was, this has never happened before uh, in the US in terms of this this visibility given to Brazil. And the last thing, which is fundamental, is that we have to, we're going to have to really fight to do this. We need to have a full-time person, a lobbyer, uh, uh, an advocate in D.C. who defends a progressive vision of Brazil. There are in Washington think tanks, there's NGOs that have different perspectives, and we have to have our own voice in Washington as well. So the possibilities... Um, are there and we have to we have to figure out where we can find resources to to find and support this person and this is going to be a collective effort uh, and is the result of a lot of years of solidarity with Brazil um, mine is actually just an announcement uh, one's an announcement I should say at, at the end of this meeting uh, which is the last panel for today those who are interested uh, meeting and Juliana will be outside and here in the U.S., uh, the International Free Lula Committee was founded, which is um, related to, excuse me, the USA F Free Lula Committee, which is related or is affiliated with the network. Uh, Natalia, Julian, the meeting are working on this. So there's going to be a 15-minute meeting or so about the committee uh, just outside for those who are interested. Okay. The second thing that I wanted to do is um, thank... Uh, talking about international cooperation, co cooperation. Thank our interpreters, <laughs> who are uh, trying to overcome the language barrier so that it's not a an issue for us. <laughs> Jordan's been doing this the whole time, and I'm making him interpret all of this at the same time. <laughs> Louise is telling me it's. I'm doing a good job. Thank you. So I'd like to open it up for questions right now, as we've as we've done, you know, maybe three and three questions so for for the people at the at the table. Okay. Oh. Good afternoon. I wanted first to thank all of you who are at the table for the the work that you've done. Um, I've you know 
followed and tried to contribute uh, in different ways, and I, I really appreciate all of your contributions. And and it's it's from this place of appreciation that my uh, my perspective of kind of a companion to you guys comes, and that's where my commentary and questions question comes from. That was really interesting. Um, it's directed especially to Alex and Juliana. Uh, I thought it was really interesting the way in which you guys presented a Congress that as a as kind of a a bridal uh, on the imperialist um, motivations that the US has right uh, this this way of kind of breaking and slowing down and controlling uh, those those instincts and so as a Brazilian in this in this situation of uh, you know post dictatorship era I've always seen the Congress a little bit more as an instrument of to, to give false legitimacy to a regime that was actually authoritarian um, in its international efforts. And so, what what I what worries me uh, in this in this uh, conception of Congress is how do we create this narrative of advocacy? <clears throat> I wanted to know, in your experience, uh, what has been the construction of this narrative so that we can uh, prevent this work from being seen as a request to the American government so that we can guarantee the democratic process in Brazil as you know as you as you put uh, said a little bit earlier and as everyone here knows you know there's a contradiction so how can we create a narrative that instead of impeding uh, or, or keeping the U.S. from 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 preserving democracy, which in reality has done the opposite. How do how do we uh, how do we frame it as their payment of a historic debt? That's that's it. I really liked your this last uh, table being one of reflection about, uh, you know, that goes beyond theory. I've been here the last two days, and I saw a lot of reflections, really important and interesting, you know, life stories. But here, uh, what was brought home to me is the strategic aspect, you know, the how-to aspects of how do we organize solidarity, how do we, how do we uh, guarantee progress. And uh, I'm really grateful for for your comments. I wanted to ask Alex a question and Juliana a question. If just um, precisely about your your comment, I hadn't thought about it in that way, but I wanted to know from you a little bit more specifically what the, the circulation of these letters. So, you know, who reads these letters? How are they written? And you know, how does the system work? This dear colleague system. Is it you know what 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 readership does it reach? You know, who 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 is who is it from? Who's it going to? What's the the reach that we can have through these letters? One more question. Does anyone have a question? So it's not really a question. I don't know if this is the right time for it, but it's a, more of an observation. Um, how I'm I'm from you know the Defend Democracy in Brazil Committee in New York, and I'm an artist. And as an artist, I think I have a role that's uh, I try to combat myths. I try to undercut myths. And one of the reasons I left Brazil 20 years ago is because of. Uh, an evil which is called uh, TV Globo, which is the national news network that creates myths. And so I think it's important for us to talk about what happened uh, at the Museum of Natural History in, in New York, you know, the cancellation of Bolsonaro's event. You know, before this becomes a myth, that we understand how it actually worked, which was a strategic question or the strategic aspects of that. So we do a lot of advocacy with the media. And so working with these media actors, especially allies, uh, and a, a couple of uh, 
you know, undercover people who have, inf have infiltrated the mainstream media. It's, uh, it's an essential battle. Um, and it requires a lot of footwork. And, you know, that we're also, we're always talking with people in Washington and figuring out who we can contact and how we can do it. But this, this work, um, for example, in, in, as it relates to Bolsonaro coming and being honored, uh, there was this article that came out that was then reprinted by the Huffington Post and that caused such a, such a strong reaction and rage against it, which was, you know, it, it helped us learn and rethink what our strategies were because we already knew, you know, what this, that this event was going to happen. We knew about it two year, two months ago, but we didn't really spread it widely because we weren't sure exactly how to, how to address it. Um, you know, we didn't want people to be repressed. We didn't want people to be afraid of, of talking about it. So we wanted to facilitate people's actions and help them have success. But the fact that, um, you know, we were interviewed recently and other people were interviewed. Some people were too afraid to talk, uh, to give interviews, but it, 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 it elevated the visibility and, uh, you know, well, we didn't, we didn't imagine that the progressive community was going to react in this way. And so we learned that we, um, you know, maybe we should have spread the word a little bit earlier so that, so that we could have an even stronger reaction. So, um, you know, they are, they're helping us on wall street and, you know, they're already by, by wanting to hold it on wall street, they're already exposing their strategies, the, the right. And I wanted to talk about this question of groups and the petition uh, of a group in, in New York, Equinvax, so, and, uh, and a group in Washington that helped um, uh, circulate this petition. But we had, uh, you know, when we did a lot of footwork, a lot of legwork, um, you know, we had to construct relationships with groups in New York. And it was really easy when Bolsonaro was elected because many of the environmental questions, especially, um, you know, LGBT T rights, uh, human rights, these issues exploded and people just uh, uh, supported us automatically. And so uh, although we'd already done protests with environmental groups, now it's now there are 11 groups. Um, and, you know, now the Brazilian groups are the minority. So for the first time in three years, uh, we have a, an amazing support from from people in the U.S. And talking about this question of fear, I think it's important for us to talk about what we learned uh, in the January protests against, excuse me, in favor of the indigenous people um, and, you know, criticizing the Bolsonaro government's measures. Uh, we saw that that Americans are willing to be on the front lines. So they're they're ready to do acts of civil disobedience and be and go to prison and those are questions and things that are really important for media coverage and uh, you know attention from celebrities and things like that. Those are those are things that we can leverage in our fight. And I, I just wanted to say that you know before we mythify what happened in the museum, that we need to realize all the legwork and all the work that went into it. You know, the question of this, the mayor canceling the event was a result of, of this, this article that was published and that, that facilitated the, the interview with him, uh, with uh, Bill de Blasio. And now it's become a war of Democrats against Republicans because Mike Pompeo has, has been announced as a co-honoree. It's uh, also a question of trying to silence the Democrat who asked the event to be canceled, who was de Blasio. You know, he asked the event to be canceled and said he didn't want it to happen in New York um, and that he couldn't guarantee security for the event. So I wanted to, to kind of undo the myth a little bit because I think it's really important, uh, this action, this, con this uh, collective action from various groups, you know, students, and scientists from the museum, uh, uh, researchers at the Museum of Natural History, artists from the, uh, you know, Brazilian progressive elites, people who have connections with the museum trustees. So there was a, a, a series of, of collective action that, actions that led to this. And I think, you know, we, we need to think more about uh, how to increase uh, our media coverage and our coordination between these various groups 
and um, use the intellectuals and the journalists who are already part of our network, it's really essential for us to be in contact so that we can generate written material. You know, because we, who are the artists who have, you know, several jobs in addition to being activists, we don't have time to write these texts uh, that just say, you know, what went on, how it, how it happened. And I think it's extremely important for us to, to write our narrative. And I also wanted to talk about, you know, I, I think it's very important for us to have the observatory and to disseminate information, have people feel that they, there is a reliable source they can go to to learn about Brazil. But it's also important to have specific criteria for information because we can't, we can't uh, afford to spread <clears throat> the, the rhetoric of the right, uh, which is extremely hard to deconstruct. And so we need to we need to deconstruct their narrative and carefully control what we put on that observatory so that we don't end up doing more harm than good. So I think uh, if you want to, you know, respond to these questions or... Um, so I'm, I'm just going to start uh, by responding to... I, I'm sorry, I forgot your question. Or the, your name. Okay, this 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 question about asking for help. I think Alex can expand, expound on this a little bit more, but as, I, as we were mentioning earlier, there is a lot of facets uh, in Congress, and uh, it can act as a brake, and it can also act as a gas pedal for, for movements and for legislature. And so, um, you know, there is some solidarity there, and we have letters that are and declarations that have come from the European Parliament, from from Germany, from Portugal, and other countries, um, and not just about Brazil, but also about these other places, uh, you know, expressing solidarity for other causes as well. A gente pode falar um pouco mais sobre isso. And to, to respond to, the, to Natasha's question, I think the letters generally are direct, uh, addressed to the Secretary of State, who is Mike Pompeo now, uh, or to the ambassador, the Brazilian ambassador to the United States, who's in Washington. So always to those two. Uh, that's, that's who the letters have always been addressed to. Um, you know, depending on the, the, the content of the letter, we've chosen one or the other or both. And... As I said earlier, we, we share, we talk about ideas and situations, what's happening. Um, when Mestre Mo was killed, there was a letter that we wrote. And, you know, there was also a declaration from the, uh, the, the uh, Congressman John Lewis. We don't even know how he found out about it. But in any case, uh, you know, it's, it's important to highlight that this is a question of lobbying. Uh, Lobbying is illegal in Brazil, but it's not here. It's legal. And so these, these NGOs and others who are always knocking on the door for, for good or for evil. So there's people there, you know, asking for support for BlackRock and other things. And, and we have to have our group uh, asking for help. And I don't, I don't know exactly how to articulate that, but, but we need to have the counterpart. We need to have the counter narrative. Can I just add something? Just a before Alex responds, I just wanted to um, think, say that it's 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 important to think about both of your questions, which is that just like Juliana mentioned uh, during her talk, that these letters were already they've been cited in in Brazilian uh, legal proceedings. I was in December. I met with various members of Parliament, and uh, and asked about you know how we can kind of establish a better relationship between between the two Congresses, and that is not an imperialistic relationship. Um, but one of the things that they said in Brazil, the progressive members of Parliament, they said Bolsonaro uses uh, the Americanizing discourse a lot. That comes from. comes from an identity, a national identity, nationalist identity um, that, you know, c comes from the U.S. And it kind of, they kind of hide behind a facade of intellectualism. Um, 
He, you know, he, so he bases things on what's said on the U.S. He cites people um, from the U.S. Um, to kind of hide or to kind of give legitimacy to his to his arguments. And so we need to do the same thing, but uh, in the opposite respect. So Jim, he gave a briefing in Congress that um, ended up having Susan Wilde al along with so Susan Wilde, she wrote a letter <clears throat> about human rights and uh, the LGBT population and their rights in Brazil. So she gave it to me. I gave it to uh, the the pe my contacts in the Brazilian government. And so we're we're creating these bridges so that these materials can be used as tools in Brazil and not just to create a narrative within the United States, but also to have it be shared in Brazil. And just another detail. This, this letter was, this is, a, this is a great story because in, the, in Jim's briefing uh, with Stan and Christian Perrier, who's, a, who's an, a guy from the Amazon Watch who works with Brazil for the last 16 years, the, the Brazilian Amazon, I should say. And you know, a lot of things were said um, and in Jim's talk, he talked about what Jean talked about, and you know, and then one or two weeks later, this letter came out, and we didn't know exactly where it came from, but we we found out that one of the interns that was at that briefing was one of the advisors to Susan White. Um, you know, the 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 congressmen themselves don't go to these briefings. Okay, we don't have <clears throat> we don't have direct contact with them. <clears throat> it's more with their their staff and stuff. So anyway, one of the interns is actually, you know, half Brazilian who grew up here is really concerned with what's happening in Brazil. Um, wrote the letter and showed it to her, and she said, "Okay, let's do it." And you know, that was the result of a briefing. So this was, you know, an hour and a half, two hour meeting that that resulted in this letter. As as Marina said, that you know the human rights issues, the environmental issues, and the, and the issues that Jean talked about as well. Good points and question. Um, first of all, it kind of made me rethink everything that I said because um, I think I maybe embellished things too much. Uh, gave too rosy an impression of Congress. Um, for one, uh, I mean, I completely agree that it uh, Congress does, um, you know, give a, a false legitimacy to the empire's uh, ugly deeds around the world, and um, y you know, the things that we've described are, and you know, the examples that I gave from the Central America um, 1980s references um, to. To what the work we've done around Honduras, um, and then the work that we've done on Brazil that Juliana described, uh, those are more exceptions than than the rule. So you know we've got to be very clear about that. Um, the other thing that uh, you know I, I didn't mention, um, and that's absolutely crucial, is the fact that um, you know none of what we, we described, including everything that happened in the 1980s, uh, in terms of the critique to. Reagan's uh, Central America policies. None of that would have happened without a really significant um, social movement. Uh, and in the US, you had an enormous movement in the 1980s um, that was a mixture of progressive, sort of faith-based people and just very radical leftists. Uh, but um, that it, it was, it was a, a very, very big movement working on all of these countries, on Guatemala, on El Salvador, on Nicaragua, traveling to those countries a lot, and that would always radicalize them, and they would come back with that experience. Um, and then uh, they, they lobbied um, Congress very, very hard, and their members, and very aggressively. Um, this is a very radical bunch of people, and, and we kind of need more of that today. So that 1980s experience, which um, I'm sure, Jim, you know much more than I do, um, was absolutely crucial to you know, members of Congress taking these positions against Reagan's policies in Central America. Um, but in terms of the historical, the historical, in terms of our approach as well, I think I want to make one thing clear, which is that there are a lot of groups that do uh, human rights work in Congress where they 
they kind of do adopt this idea that the U.S. Um, can do good around the world and can, can help um, promote human rights. Um, the angle that we have is a little bit different from that, and it's more that the U.S. Um, you know, typically is um, helping violate human rights, and we need to stop that. So the, the examples I gave on Honduras, for instance, are exactly that. It's all of the, the assistance that the U.S. is giving to the security forces of Honduras and giving to the government there directly that is causing these horrible abuses against activists. Um, similarly, on Brazil, um, and, and this was true especially in the early letters, we focused on the fact that uh, the Obama administration was helping enable the coup in Brazil um, by offering all sorts of support. Um, you know, the Treasury Secretary who basically said, okay, business is open in Brazil and we need to support investment in Brazil. Um, uh, Secretary of State John Kerry who traveled to Brazil just before the trial of Dilma um, and, and met with the foreign minister at the time and held a press conference very supportive of the Temer um, you know, uh, provisional government. Uh, so, you know, we put those critiques out there and, and we, we need to continue to do that because, I mean, certainly my position is that the less the U.S. is involved in these countries around the world, the better for the world. Um, so uh, I think we have more opportunities today uh, and you were mentioning the historical debt. That's another thing that we work on a lot. We've worked on it in particular around uh, Central America migration. Uh, everyone talks about the root causes, that there are economic problems and violence in Central America, but they pretend as if those problems you know, come from those countries entirely uh, and they completely forget the U.S. role. And so that's where we ri remind people of all of the U.S. intervention in those countries in the 1980s. Uh, you know, we also remind them of the, the free trade agreement that the U.S. pushed through and the neoliberal policies that the U.S. Uh, you know, helps impose through development banks and so on. Um, and, and, and then the fact that you know, gang members from the U.S. are the gangs that exist in Central America that are now plaguing Guatemala, Honduras, El Salvador, they come from the U.S. originally. They're deportees. Uh, so, you know, we point out all of these things and we've gotten members of Congress, particularly from the Progressive Caucus, to, uh, you know, also talk about these things. Um, and, and we're seeing, I think, more opportunities now because we have, you know, very radical members of Congress now. We have people like Ilya Omar, Rashida Tlaib. It's maybe just a coincidence that both of, both of them are Muslim, but they have kind of the most very overtly anti-imperialist views. Um, and, and, and so we're able to do a lot with that. And if you look for Ilyan Omar and Elliot Abrams, for instance, you can see how she takes him on, but not, not just him, but sort of the policies that he represents, you know, that people in Washington tend to gloss over. And with that, you have a very young, radicalized generation uh, that's coming of age and getting involved in politics, in part through Bernie Sanders and so on, and they're inspired, and, and they also have I think very anti-imperialist views. Um, and then Natasha's question on uh, the letters. Um, so th the, the letters, you know, we, we propose ideas to offices and then they agree with some, they, they don't with others and, and, and they end up drafting a letter. The, the real big challenge with the letters is first getting uh, members of Congress to lead or get two co-leads, so you have to convince them. And so you work with the staffers, you, you argue with them, you get constituents to try to put pressure on them. And then once you get them to lead, you have to find people that are willing to sign on to the letter. And so that's another uh, challenge, and that's where the work of a big coalition is very helpful. And we're really just one or two people in a congressional district making a phone call or even sending an email can get a signature from an office. Much more than me making a phone call or uh, sending an email. Uh, people care a lot more about the people that are voting for them than they do about you know, those of us that are in Washington. Um, so it, it sometimes requires really very little effort from people to get signatures on letters. You know, I think we want to emphasize that. It's, it's not it's not necessarily a, a huge, huge challenge to do that. Um, 
and then in terms of who reads the letters, um, I, I think you know Juliana's talked about the media impact that those letters have and how they help reshape the debate. But it's it's also you help educate the the, the congressional members and staff because they don't want to sign on to something that they don't believe in. So they go over the letters. Um, they ask you about every little part of it, and they say, "Is you know, show me the evidence of this. Show me the evidence of that." And you get to engage with them on this topic, and they end up a lot more knowledgeable about the topic as a result. So that whole process of circula circulating a letter and getting signers for the letter actually really helps you educate you know, the different offices. And, and suddenly they know a lot more and are willing to take bigger risks or willing to take you know, positions that they wouldn't have taken previously. Um, yeah, and I think that's the main thing. In, on December 12th of um, 2018, or excuse me, 68, uh, this, per this person was killed for, for denouncing uh, the, the murders and the tortures that were going on in Brazil. He was... Uh, <coughs> Pushed out of, pushed out of uh, Congress. He was he was excuse me. He wasn't murdered. He was he was banished, and so he went to Chile, and Antonio Calado said that he was uh, kind of part of the elite. He was he was married to a French noble from somebody from a French noble family. So he had a lot of possibilities. But he Antonio Calado said, "Stay here." <coughs> so he stayed one year in Chile. <coughs> and he learned how th what the situation was like in Chile, and then he went to Europe. And, and in Europe, he organized a, a huge effort in solidarity with the, the Brazilian resistance for a long, long time. His work was really, really important, and nobody's written about this. But before going to Europe, he went to the United States two times. And he went to Congress, and because he was a congressman, people believed that he wasn't lying because he was saying that the campaign against Brazil was, you know, this idea that the, the communist threat in Brazil was a real thing. He said that was a lie. He spoke English really well. He was uh, accomplished. And he, he was able to tell people, and people believed him when he said, no, this is a lie. This is a hoax. So th there's not a communist threat in the United States. <coughs> okay, there, now uh, there's a... Marcos Ajuda was a young... Brazilian who almost died in prison in 1970. Then he left after the dictatorship went to the U.S. He wrote a, an article or an editorial in the Washington Post about his experience with the dictatorship. And he, the Washington Post the next day said, came out and said, we cannot support the Brazilian government because it's a dictatorship. We, we have to believe his account. And the Washington Post and New York Times, uh, after... 71, after those, uh, those editorials, they became very anti-dictatorship in Brazil. And it doesn't change everything, but in 73, 74, the American government didn't help the Brazilian government anymore. So, you know, the military leaders in Brazil had other resources by then, but I think, you know, the work in Congress is, you know, is an imperialist organization, has different interests, um, you know, and just like the Brazilian Congress, there are people who are w with differing views. There, there are also, you know, there are people there that that can and are willing to have solidarity with us, and we need to contact those people. And second, in my experience, um, on Facebook and, and talking to other people in, in other ways, I, I feel a, a great importance, the great need for people in Brazil to to feel that people outside Brazil care about them, people have 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 thanked me for things that I have done. It's not because I you know I'm feeling charitable toward Brazil. It's because I I'm I am uh, committed to preserving human rights in Brazil, and so even though you know the 21 s signatures that we've gotten on that letter, the fact that they've that they are signing it, that they have are denouncing. Uh, the aggressions against indigenous populations, black populations, this is really important. And, and divulging that and spreading that information, spreading that word is a small act, 
among many other small acts for the resistance that we have to to uh, pursue in Brazil and outside of Brazil in solidarity and communicating with each other so that we can construct this really big, plural, multivocal movement, not forgetting about, you know, the important fights that have happened over the last few years to topple this government and to and to uh, improve the government system in Brazil. And, and I think, <clears throat> you know, that'll have an effect on our country too and the idiot who's in the White House right now. So I just wanted to end saying one other thing, which is that there is a, a librarian who researched in the University of Li uh, uh, Library of Congress catalog and uh, researched, you know, what are the what are the what are the codes used for cataloging um, for, for that talk about the coup of '64? So, so how is that referred to in the Library of Congress? System and so she's working with us, and we're 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 doing you know all this legwork with librarians so that we can change the way that these texts are categorized in the Library of Congress. You know, this is it may seem like a, a simple thing when we started talking about it. It didn't have it was it was just a symbolic act, but now that Bolsonaro has been talking about uh, the, the coup not being a coup, that it was actually a, a democratic revolution, this is really, really important. And we're going to have to continue this fight so that we can convince the National you know, Library of Congress to change the way they classify and talk about the dictatorship. It seems like a really small thing, but it has a really big effect. Uh, I think we have time for one more quick round of questions and, and answers, <laughs> brief answers as well. So <clears throat> can you hear me? So two questions to So two questions. Um, talking about um, expo the, the 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 explanation that was given, we've we've heard about the you know kind of the horse historical context that you guys uh, elaborated here. But for us, this um, this solidarity and these efforts to kind of build bridges between groups and fight for democracy in Brazil. These are all this is all new to us. So I, I've I've been reflecting about you know, the, the relationship between the North and the South. Because until now, I've heard about a lot of the efforts here. But I want to talk about how, how, can, we, how can we link these people who are, who are acting in their very distinct spheres in the United States, in their local areas. How can we, um, you know, who are, who are the people in, who are the potential people we can talk with between the North and South? You know, academics, activists, uh, urban movements, rural movements, you know, uh, people within the institution of the government, but that have uh, an you know, important role in defending democracy and human rights. And I'm trying, to, uh, I'm trying to think about, you know, who might these people be that we could talk to? And so the other question is, um, has to do with this idea that we, we are trying to situate the, the, the historical moment in which we're living, right? So one thing, it's one thing to articulate the, denou the denunciations that you're doing and to kind of denounce the dictatorship, uh, the agreements that were made, and um, the way that that happened. But uh, it's another thing to say that despite the violations of human rights, uh, you know, we still classify the government as being democratic. So I think there's, you know, the, uh, there's the institutional aspects, Congress and other, other venues. What we cannot give in to this idea that um, who, those who support conservative, we can't, we can't fall into this trap of, of thinking, you know, the right versus the left. And on, and on a big scale, that might be true. Um, but we have to realize that, uh, you know, I think when we think about it in that way, it, it diminishes the potential of the, de the denunciations that we're trying to do. What, what, is in, what is in jeopardy 
is the violation of international accords that Brazil and other countries um, are have signed. And so when these violations happen, whether they're social violations or environmental uh, regulations, it's it's not only the left that's losing, it's, it's the people, it's these groups, it's the environment, <clears throat> it's these people who are part of these groups that are being protected. And so the risk is a lot bigger than just the right versus left. Because if we don't give any importance to the accords that international have have been put forward internationally you know when an indigenous person is their rights are violated when a when a rural worker rights are violated when the environmental impact uh when an environmental rights are are violated then that weakens those international accords that our countries have signed and that's another thing that we need to reinforce in terms of the the attempt to to hold people responsible. So, um, you know, the Trump government, the Bolsonaro government, as they try and violate these human rights, but they are all in a bigger, s uh, on the bigger scale, they are trying to break these international accords that, that their countries have signed. Marlon, let's take your question and then we'll, and then we'll finish. <clears throat> uh, a really simple, maybe innocent question, but this, this, this whole thing about the museum, do you know, don't, don't you guys think it, it's that, that you could maybe, we could think about uh, a letter from Brazilians living in the US to talking about the importance that this decision had, a collective letter that's, that says, you know, this is super relevant. I know there's a risk um, of, of kind of exciting the other side, the right to write a protest letter. We, we'd have to think about that, but I'm wondering if it would be helpful um, you know, in as you were talking about Ayala and thinking about the north and north and south, if if it would be helpful to write a letter to the mayor of of New York and other groups ex expressing gratitude. So we'll talk a little bit more about this. <clears throat> there were a lot of tweets of people thanking. Uh, you know, when the when the museum tweeted, there was a ton of uh, thank thank you tweets posted by people. Uh, but I think the idea of writing a letter is a great way, and that would formalize kind of the our giving of thanks and and right to Bill de Blasio as well and, and thank him. I think that's that's all that's all I'm aware of. One of the things the museum is not gonna change what it's always you know, it's always been a Republican thing and it's not gonna change in terms of becoming not becoming a conservative <coughs> The danger that we run is like you know if we just blindly think, and not and not address it to those who are actually instrumental in canceling the event. Uh, you know it's important for us to thank the scientists, the the researchers, the students who were there, mobilizing and 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 protesting. Um, you know we we can't forget that a lot of the trustees are directly responsible for the election of Bolsonaro. Rebecca Mercer, who's uh, Robert Mercer's daughter, um, and who's Steve Bannon's uh, partner. So we have, I'm saying this because there are a lot of groups related to our work that have never, if, if we went to thank them, you know, we can't just thank people blindly. We need to thank those who are actually doing the work. We need to, we need to make it a, a focused thank you. Okay, so let's focus on Ayala's question. Um, well, Okay, so why did we organize this conference? Why were you invited to this conference? Because objectively, there are there are many places of resistance. You know, Brown is is one of them. We've had an important trajectory of resistance. It's, it wasn't a coincidence. This this program, Marina, Ramon, and I, we thought a lot about you know who will be presenting, who represents this issue, uh, who represents the things that we want to talk about here. So it wasn't a coincidence that how many, how many talks did you give before you came here? So we have, we have a partnership with friends of MSTs. Uh, you know, we we've been friends with them and we had a relationship with them ever since their founding. And so I think that's a model of creating international solidarity, in a very respectful way, and supporting social movements in Brazil. And so we, you know, what do we do? We 
friends of MST, who was the person, who, who would you recommend for this activity? And so, you know, they recommended a bunch of people. Um, they talked about it and they said, okay, you tell us who, who we should, who we should ask. And, you know, of course, it's possible that, that this person can go to other places and give talks as well. So everybody who has, has been invited to this event, uh, we're hoping that they become our partners. You know, it's a, it's a national network. It's decentralized. It's nonpartisan, but it's a nonpartisan democratic network. We want that everyone uh, who wants to can, can take part. You know, solidarity, we want to hold activities, have events, um, and motivate people to engage in this dialogue. Those who are here are here because they love Brazil. And, you know, we have that solidarity with them, and we want to expand that. We want to, we have a, a good group here because Trump has, uh, has inspired a lot of hate against him and his government, and Bolsonaro as I said in the opening, as he has been, uh, you know, called the Trump of the tropics, a lot of people don't really know who Bolsonaro is if they, if they say, oh, he's, oh, he's like the, the dictator in the Philippines. He's like the guy in Poland. He represents the new right. So that really helps people understand what he's about. And, and having people who aren't tied in with our movement... Um, it, it's, it's an easy way for them to understand a little bit about Bolsonaro and what's going on in Brazil. And, you know, uh, there's been talks about uh, descendants of Afro-Brazilians. This is kind of a, n a new thing that comes from North American academics, uh, kind of uh, creating solidarity between these two groups of North, North America and Brazil. And I think it's a, a beautiful thing that's happening right now. We want to do this with the 14 working groups that we have and others that people want to create, may want to create, and <clears throat> always very conscious of our direction. Um, and that, that this is, you know, the hierarchical relationship between the North and the South. And there are people that have been fighting for decades to undo this hierarchy. Um, I, I really wanted to thank everyone for being here. I know that You'll have to leave more tomorrow morning, many of you. Uh, but I'd like to thank you for your participation in this event, for the way in which you were uh, very disciplined with the the times and the food, so that there was enough food for everyone. And Ramon was he was uh, he was beside himself and he's saying, "Oh no, we're not going to have enough food for everyone." But next time we'll order a little bit more food. Um, I'd like to thank the interpreters again, who uh, deserve another round of applause. And Harvard, uh, our great partner, Bruno and Sydney, who ha are doing a really important work uh, at Harvard and working with us. And all of you, this is not the first time that you've been, uh, this, is, this will not be the last time you come to Brown. You know, We hope you continue coming and sharing your ideas with us. It's a really important. And so in the name of Brown University, I would like to, and, and in behalf of the organizing committee, I'd like to thank all of you for having participated in this project this, that is so important. And I hope that those who are able to be here tomorrow will come so that we can talk about tactics and strategies. Thank you.